Hollywood Studios, or as it was originally known, MGM Studios, has been the home to many, many shows since its opening in 1989. High School Musical used to travel down the Hollywood Boulevard daily. Doug had a musical. The much-loved Mulch, Sweat and Shares closed out the year with a New Year's celebration. And even Ace Ventura visited the studios. Nonsense, poopy pants! <laughs> this, though, is Expedition Scream Park. And we are taking a look at the short-lived Goosebumps, Horrorland, Fright Show and Funhouse. I write the Goosebumps books. You're not R.L. Stein. I am. Oh, yeah? Who's working your head? <laughs> you look almost lifelike. Thanks for the compliment. But I'm the real R.L. Stein. Really? If you're R.L. Stein, what is today's story? American author Robert Lawrence Stein, or as he is more widely known, R.L. Stein, is the author of horror fiction novels for children. He also was co-creator and head writer for the Nickelodeon show Eureka's Castle, which aired from 1989 to 1995. In 1992, he would release his first book of a new series called Welcome to Dead House, a series of scary but funny books for younger children, each featuring a standalone story covering the adventures of a group of children. The original plan was to create six books, but the series was so popular it would span 62 in total. Within a month after release, books would sell millions of copies, and by the mid-1990s, four million copies a month. Bumps. They're so good. It's scary. It wasn't just within the United States. They were sold in over 20 languages, with the books being widely popular in the United Kingdom, France, and Australia. I spent many nights as a kid reading Goosebumps, and they could be really, really scary. At least at the time, anyway. My favourite of all the original books would be book number 16, One Day at Horrorland, a book where the Morris family and their friends became lost and accidentally found the Horrorland theme park. Monsters inside the theme park called the Horrors attacked the family, and they were defeated by being pinched. By 1995, the books were being adapted to a TV show for Fox Kids. Goosebumps was the series that introduced a whole generation of children in the 90s to horror. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner. I'm here in the virtual reality studio where Disney Imagineers are creating a whole new world of storytelling. Throughout the 90s, Disney was aiming to appeal more and more to teenagers rather than just children. For the kids, Disney had them covered with countless animated classics. They would look outside the company though for the inspiration to expand this reach with such properties as Alien in the Magic Kingdom and the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, sorry, I mean Ninja Turtles for the Americans. Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. MGM Studios would be the perfect place to introduce more and more non-Disney owned properties. In fact, Disney had nothing to do at all with the Goosebumps publications or the television show, but they wanted to bring the brand to the newest Disney park to try and continue the appeal to the teenage crowd. It turned out that R.L. Stein was a huge fan of Disney. You can see this yourself just by a simple search on Twitter, with Stein tweeting about how much Disney has influenced his writing how much of a fan he is of the movies, and confirming that the Goosebumps land was a thrill to him and he couldn't believe he had his own land at Disney. Right before Halloween, 1997, on October 8th, Goosebumps, Horrorland, Fright Show and Funhouse took over a large section of the streets of America. Walt Disney World was planning to give visitors Goosebumps. Literally. Get it? The show was built on a stage designed to look like a warehouse loading dock and would feature characters from the books. A magic show that mysteriously goes wrong with some gruesome surprises. Following the show, the audience would then be led into a fun house where monsters lurked in a hall of mirrors. Offering five 15-minute shows a day, frightening favourites would come to life at the end of New York Street. The show would be set inside Horrorland itself. It began much like the TV show opening, with a man in black clothing walking with a suitcase as the theme song plays. See, almost 
identical. Amazo the Magician would then pop out to start his magic deck. The character himself's first appearance was in the book Bad Hair Day. Amazo was turned into a rabbit and built a dummy to perform his show. He also appeared in Return to Horrorland performing his magic show. In the show though, he was much more human of course. Welcome to the illustrious Goosebump Sideshow of magic and mayhem. Now in a moment, right before your very eyes, you will see some amazing wonders, some startling sights, and some huge feats. Papa! Oh, stop it, you're me. Mezo would call up two children from the audience to perform a cutting arm trick. Kids, I guarantee the two of you will be completely stumped. Here we go. One. Two. Three. They are then put into a box with a lowering layer of spikes. The perfect way to attract teens is to show them kids about to be maimed. Hakuna, Watata, Butos, Butos, Gary! Hey! Going out in the corner! Hey, I get something wrong! Who's gonna pull this back? Hey, I can't stop this thing! This is Disney though, and the kids were of course not impaled with spikes, and instead it was revealed another character from the book, Slappy, was inside. Oh, oh kids, I. Hey, who's working your head? You look almost. Life Slappy the ventriloquist dummy was the star of the Night of the Living Dead set of books, starting with book number 7. Slappy would not become the main antagonist until the second book though. R.L. Stein said he took the inspiration of Slappy from Pinocchio and another series that had recently opened in the MGM studios, The Twilight Zone. Back to the show though, Slappy refuses to reveal where the two children have gone and announces that he will make the audience his slaves. Hey, wait a minute, what do you think you're doing? I am going to make all these people my slaves! What? Oh no you're not! Stop right there, Papa Dad! Amazo attempts to make Slappy disappear, but instead makes Curly the skeleton appear above the stage. Ooh, dudes! Pretty Curly's the name! Horror's the game! Just call me your master of scaremonies! <laughs> Step aside, Amazo! This is my show now! Curly, who had been created as the mascot of the series after the publisher found it hard to sell merchandise as each book had a different cast of characters, was one of the more recognisable from the series. Along with Curly, more menacing characters began to be introduced on stage, including Prince Koru from Return of the Mummy. Wait just a moment, Prince. Or should I call you the mummy formerly known as Prince? <laughs> where together they attack Amazo and throw him into a cage. They use magic to summon Cuddles the Hamster from Monster Blood 2. At this point, many children actually found the show kind of scary. Curly announces that they will keep the audience prisoners until the Terror Tower Executioner from A Night in Terror Tower and two haunted masks come out and scare Slappy, Curly, Prince Koru and Cuddles away. <laughs> Finally, to end the show, it's revealed that the executioner is actually a Mazo in disguise, and the two haunted masks are the two kids who went missing earlier. A classic Goosebumps twist. Finally, Amazo tells the audience to check out the Goosebumps Funhouse and the show ends. The show was clearly an inspiration for Jack's Carnival of Carnage show at Halloween Horror Nights. This is my show! <laughs> for the two children selected to be in the show, especially if they were a fan of Goosebumps, it was a dream come true and one of the most memorable aspects to a day at MGM Studios. To those watching the show though, it received a mixed review. Due to the controversial nature of the show, it really did not feel like a show at a Disney park and that was exactly what they were going for, to try and compete with Universal for that teenage group. Looking back at the show today though, it's hard to imagine anything like this ever being at a Disney park. As for the fun house, it received an even bigger, lukewarm reaction. The original maze was more of a traditional house of mirrors that was quite simple to make your way through. Due to popular demand, it was updated to add some difficulty and the lighting dimmed as well as characters from the show appearing as you made your way through. The Funhouse name edition of the attraction was eventually dropped so people did not expect too much within. You could get photos with a few of these characters in the area also. 
On October 31st, 1997, you could even meet R.L. Stein himself, who would appear in the Spooky Star Motorcade, a handprint ceremony, as well as signing his latest book, Goosebumps 61, I Live in Your Basement. For a short time at MGM Studios, children could get their picture taken with a dummy that right before wanted to enslave them. It really was a different time back then. Al Wise, president of Walt Disney World Resort, unveiled the project in June 1997 in conjunction with the chairman of Parachute Properties, the company which developed the series. Stated they were delighted to bring the adventures Stein delivers in his books to our dimensions of adventure, appealing to kids, teenagers, and adults alike. R.L. Stein's wife is quoted as saying that for Bob, taking Goosebumps to Disney World is like going to heaven. He adores everything and anything Disney, but sadly by the time it was added, it was too late. The show only ran for just over a year before it ended on November 1st, 1998. Goosebumps sales were on the decline by the time the show had even opened. R.L. Stein said that they didn't sell enough t-shirts in the store, so Disney closed it down. While Goosebumps was a good idea for the MGM park, it was just a little bit too late. By 1997, the book's publisher's sales had dropped 40%. The decline made front page news and the Goosebumps show was no more. One of the short-lived shows among many others that came and went at the MGM Studios park. By 2008, the Goosebumps series maintains an 82% brand awareness among children aged 7 to 12. By 2014, over 350 million copies of Goosebumps books have been sold in 32 languages. There have been television adaptions, film adaptions, video games, comics, and countless merchandise sold. R.L. Stein still remains a huge fan of Disney. The Goosebumps series is the second highest selling book series of all time, behind only a certain boy wizard. If Potter can save Universal and come with two highly detailed, fully fledged theme park lands, then maybe one day, being the second highest series, we will see a full scale, Horrorland, Goosebumps inspired spooky world, full of characters from the books and scary experiences for the whole family. One can only wish. I am sick of these scary human shows. Ugh. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Screen Park. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition. Would you like to see Goosebumps again in a theme park? Let me know in the comments below. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates on upcoming episodes, and we will see you next time.